This is a video on the different methods in which Image AI can help with animation, with practically complete control over the results. You can find all the technical details in the link in the description, since it's better and faster to explain them that way. This video also uses methods shown in my other videos, so feel free to check them out too. Wink 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 wonk! To start off, a couple of quick tips about how animation works in Krita itself, though I recommend looking for dedicated tutorials and videos about it too. First, enable the animation docker if you haven't already, by going to Settings, Dockers, and Enabling Animation Timeline. I have it undocked and floating because it's easier for me to manage. Now, every animation software has its own particular quirks, including Krita. So first make a new layer, then in the animation docker click the Add Blank Keyframe button. This will convert that layer into a special animation layer. Animation layers are like weird folders that you can't really edit like a normal folder, yet still contain all the keyframes that you can see in the animation docker. This is important to know, because anything not contained inside that animation layer is a bit trickier to handle. Especially if you do a refine pass or even regular generate, or any other result from the Krita AI plugin. That result will be a regular layer that might throw you off at first on why it's not showing up in your animation. You can either convert that result to an animation layer, or even simpler, just cut and paste that result into your main animation layer. Simply select the entire canvas while having that non-animation layer selected, cut that result with Control X, delete that leftover blank layer. Then on the animation docker, select your main animation layer and also select the frame where you want to paste it and go to edit, paste into active layer. If the frame you selected was blank, it will make a new keyframe with whatever you pasted. If the frame already had something in it, it will be overwritten by what you pasted. This is especially useful if you did refine passes on a frame, and thus you want to replace the original frame with the improved result. There are other ways to do this, like selecting the non-animation frame, pressing the add blank keyframe button, then dragging that keyframe to your main animation timeline, whichever method is easier for you. Also, I recommend pinning your main animation timeline using the pin button to make it easier to track. There are other animation-related things to be aware of, like clip end, frame rate, onion skins, even inserting audio. Again, I recommend looking for better dedicated tutorials about the particulars of Krita's animation tools. So, the most basic and uncontrollable method is to start from a regular generation. Simply generate a couple of images and change the prompt depending on the new poses and camera angles you want. This method provides the least amount of consistency too, as it's just relying on noise dice rolls. However, you can still use good old draw refine to try and fix the results. A more controllable method is you sketching out, or scribbling, or even color blobbing your frames, and then doing either regular draw refine, or also using control net to complete those sketches. Just like regular frame-by-frame -frame animation, this should give you the most amount of control, as you're literally controlling what happens in every frame. But just like regular draw refine and control net, you will still need to manually fix inconsistencies between each frame, especially with control net, since the results depend on how defined or scribbly your initial input image is. Even with very defined line art as your control image, some details might still change more than you might want. Thus, the next method is starting off from a very clean and very defined initial image as your starting frame, and doing something similar to traditional puppet-style animation. Make an initial frame through any method, and make sure it has all the details you want already settled and complete. It preferably should be as clean and as finished as possible. Then, simply use regular Krita selection and transform tools, and also brushes, to repose the character, or object or anything really, to the next frame of animation you want. For example, with this character, I'm moving her arms and legs, and also her tail, and doing a bit of squash and stretch to make the next two frames, starting off from that initial frame. I'm also doing some light brush work and refined passes to even out and clean up all these changes. And thus, you can keep doing this over and over, until all your frames and your full animation are done. However, one drawback of this method is the inherent nature of using transform tools will make your image blurrier as you go along. This isn't that big of an issue, as refine passes, and even upscalers or even the unblur control net or regular Krita and Gimmick sharpen filters can make your results sharper again, though this can still have some impact on line consistency. You can also just keep using the first initial result and repose that since it will be sharper and cleaner instead of reposing the following frame and then reposing that result too and so on. This can be harder though, as you'll be basically starting from the first frame over and over instead of building off from motion that's easier to track. A bigger issue in all of these cases is color consistency, as just the nature of using Refine will keep shifting and degrading your colors after each pass, and thus also after each frame. Thus in this case, I would recommend doing traditional puppet animation instead. For that, you can take your first frame, and separate each of the body parts that will move into their own layers, or just a single layer, to then import those into your animation software of choice. You can still use Draw Refine passes, to fix the parts that are being cut out, and complete any lines that look chopped off or incomplete. You can also use the upscale function to increase the resolution and sharpness of your model base. Then import that into your animation software and vectorize it or use it as is depending on how that program handles puppet animation. However, an even better method and the meat of this tutorial is using video models. In this case, using the regular image to video WAN 2.2 model as it provides a good amount of quality. As long as it has an image to video function and a start frame and end frame function 
any future video model should also work. Any of the previous methods mentioned in this tutorial can also still be used in conjunction with this video model. A regular generation, draw refine, control net, puppet posing, anything really, as long as you get a nice and clean first frame. Then you can simply use that frame as your starting frame. Prompt the type of motion or action you want, select the duration, and wait for the result. It goes without saying that, just like regular generate for static images, this is also leaving the motion to dice rolls, which means you won't exactly have full control over it. However, by starting off with a frame of your own, you can at least have a bit of control over that. This means the consistency of the animation will be relative to that initial frame, which also means you can control the style, the character's features, the initial pose, camera position, and so on. Especially in relation to style, this also means you can use 3D models, clay figures, and any type of 2D or 3D style or medium really, and the style will be picked up and kept pretty consistent, even without style lauras, though you can also use them if you want. Also more on consistency in a bit. Now, for practically absolute control, you can use the start frame and end frame function instead. This means, you are the one providing the initial frame, and the next frame of animation, exactly as you want them, and the model will simply provide the interpolation between each frame. This interpolation can be as small or as drastic as you want. That is to say, the motion can be very simple, like a character just moving their arms a bit, or you can also go to a completely different pose or even a new camera angle. Thus, you can have precise control by just interpolating keyframes that are relatively closer together and just get a couple of in-between frames. But you might also not care as much over every precise frame as long as the overall motion is carried out between keyframes. And of course, you can also apply traditional animation principles once your frames are generated, regardless of method. For example, you can add as many hold frames as necessary to extend motion and accentuate key poses. You can also use regular draw refine methods to tweak whatever in-between frames might need fixing or even keyframes. You can even add animation smear frames this way. And you can also combine interpolation with regular image to video and keep chaining and piggybacking off from each method. For example, for anything you might want to save time on, doing a different key pose or action, or that you might even have trouble visualizing it, you can prompt for that instead. I would recommend doing image to video for simpler actions, where the control over it doesn't matter as much as long as the action is properly executed, which sometimes can take a while. But you can use it for any action, really. Again, as long as the action and motion is carried out as you wanted it to, if it works, it works. Then you can also make a more controlled manual keyframe, a very specific pose or angle or anything really that you can interpolate to, and go on from there. You can even use edit models like Flux Context, Quen Image Edit, or even Nano Banana to make a new frame to interpolate to, and then also make the next keyframe after that and go on from there. Hopefully, this very basic method of make good keyframe, make another good keyframe, and interpolate to that, or also just generate motion from good keyframe, is easy enough to understand. Just like regular image models have been good enough for a while to practically let you make anything you want with some manual work of your own, I believe that free video models, at least WAN 2.2, are also at that initial stage of letting you animate whatever you want. I tried other video models in the past, the paid ones were decent but also very limited when using the free versions, and local models weren't as good. Framepack got very close to being a good local solution, but its frame interpolation wasn't quite there yet. I've actually been meaning to make this video for a long while, at least the frame by frame and puppet animation parts, with a conclusion on how it was kind of a meme method, because video models eventually would be good enough to do it faster. Well, that time is now, at least with WAN 2.2. However, just like regular image models have their own AI quirks that need manual fixes, these are some video AI quirks you'll probably encounter. First, the still only big real issue for image AI in general that hopefully one day will be truly solved, color consistency. This one is tricky because the color consistency of the colors themselves is relatively good. This means you won't get a high amount of color shifting, not from the colors themselves anyway. However, you might still get an amount of brightness and contrast shifting due to the nature of denoising itself. You can see some examples of this here. This is likely just due to the nature of denoising, though it can also be potentially further reduced or even eliminated with better settings in mind or even higher resolutions. It might even be due to using sage attention. You might also get some noisy artifacts on certain seeds, like in this example. Again, this can potentially be improved with better settings, and I've rarely encountered this, as image quality in general is still very good too. Issues like that aside, as long as your colors are 100% consistent, especially when doing frame interpolation, color consistency is pretty good. You can see in this example where colors stay pretty consistent the whole way through. However, if colors in between frame shift, then color shifting will indeed be more noticeable. For example, if you do interpolation from a generated frame that had brightness shift to a manually made frame with the intended colors, then the difference in colors will be noticeable. But even then, again, color consistency is still relatively very consistent. Just make sure your keyframes are 100% color consistent. Another option, if you want absolute control over colors, is simply animating everything in black and white and then coloring every frame manually. That is to say, your starting frame and any other keyframes should be in black and white or at least in grayscale before using either image to video or interpolation. 
this will definitely be more time consuming, but will completely ensure that every color stays consistent. For this, you can use the anime industry method of converting your line art to hard pixels. You can open Gimmick, search for the stamp filter, tweak some of the sliders so your line art is nice and defined, and then apply the results. You can also assign a hotkey to filter, reapply the last Gmic filter to make it easier to apply the stamp filter to all frames, or rather to all frames that need it, since you will still need to apply the filter individually to every frame, as currently there is no way to apply any Gmic filter to multiple images, hence the shortcut to at least do this faster. Simply go to Settings, Configure Krita, Keyboard Shortcuts, search for Filter, and assign the shortcut combination of your choice to the option there. This will give you sharp pixel lines that will be much easier to color, and then you can simply do Filter, Colors, and Color to Alpha to remove the background, and color from there. You can also use a keyboard shortcut to repeat that, which you might already have noticed in the same section as the one for Gimmick. By default, it's Control F, and then you can color that line art on a separate layer using your preferred method. You can simply use the paint bucket or even use coloring masks. I recommend looking up dedicated Krita tutorials for coloring masks and any other Krita tool that you might want to learn more about, to be honest. If you want to save time on coloring, you can still simply only color specific keyframes and interpolate to those. Again, color consistency is usually fine in that case as long as all keyframe colors 100% match. However, if you use the stamp filter method, I would recommend smoothing out that pixelated line art first, as the video model can pick up that pixelization and reduce image quality, more noticeable in the first frame, but also all of them really. You can do this in various ways. One of them is using Gimmick and the Smooth Geometric Median Filter. Adjust the sliders to your liking until the line art is smooth enough and the pixelization is removed without being too blurry. Another method is using Krita AI's upscale function and a good upscale model, even at just 1x scale so the image size doesn't change, but the upscale model is still applied. I found Yandere Neo is decent enough, and you can also repeat the upscale once or twice for better results. However, I would recommend using this method before coloring, as upscale models can also change colors and thus color consistency. You could also use the good old Gaussian blur method, just make sure to do it with your black line art on a white background, that is, before applying color to alpha. First go to Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur and set the slider to a small amount, here I did about 5. Then go to Filter, Adjust, Color Adjustment Curves and adjust the curve until the lines are sharp enough and the pixelization is removed. You could even auto-vectorize your keyframes in your favorite vector program and then take them back to Krita. Or you could also avoid dealing with pixel line art by not using the stamp filter at all and just coloring on the results of your generation, refine, control net, etc. There are many methods and approaches. Another point to consider in relation to image quality is resolution. VRAM requirements for video models are more exponential than image models, and thus, at least currently, it's better to stick to lower resolutions. With my 12GB, I can somehow do a resolution of 1024x1024 pixels, but doing full 1080p, that is 1920x1080 pixels, makes my GPU explode. In that case, for a 16x9 resolution for example, it might be better to work at 720p, that is 1280x720, and then upscale the results with a proper video upscaling method and model. For maximum sharpness and pixel quality, I would honestly consider doing everything manually in a more traditional way, but still with the help of video AI assistance. This means generating your black and white line art frames at 1024 by 1024, which is already almost the entire vertical resolution of 1080p, or even at full 1080 by 1080. Then do your coloring, scene compositing, camera effects, and any other traditional animation principles on your target resolution canvas of 1080p, or even in 4K. You'll still be saving time on having all the baseline work already animated which in some cases can be the most time-consuming part. Another issue is motion blur, or rather the model trying to attempt it. You might get some lines that are too crunchy, pixelated, or incomplete. I managed to improve this considerably over the default settings, but some in-between frames can still have these issues. Those can be fixed the same way as regular image AI quirks, with simple manual tweaks and refined passes, either on the full image or just a selection on that specific part, also known as in-paint. Another issue is consistency, or rather, what you need to be aware of regarding it. That is to say, consistency is usually very good. As long as there is enough information that allows for that consistency, that means this mostly only applies to image to video instead of interpolation. When doing image to video, it understandably can only take into account the consistency from the only literal frame of reference being provided. This means anything that stays in frame will usually stay consistent, however, as soon as something leaves and re enters the frame, the consistency can shift. You can see this in this example. As soon as her hands left the frame, she gained wristwatches for some reason, and her nail polish color also changed. In this other example, using this wink frame as the starting point for image to video, her eyes color and the style of her eyes also changed. Again, this is because it doesn't really have the context of all the previous frames, if that context isn't outright provided. It only has the context of that one specific frame being used as reference. So for those specific cases, it's better to use frame interpolation instead. Those cases being, if a character winks, if something goes out of frame and re-enters, if a character turns around or changes camera angles and so on. 
By providing a starting frame and an end frame, you can pretty much keep 100% of the consistency from the context of those two frames. Also, maybe it goes without saying, but even though it's called end frame, just mentalize it as just the next frame, like a motion tween frame or something like that. Just so some Redditor doesn't go, what do you mean it's not the very last end frame of the animation? Another important quirk to be aware of is regarding the duration of the frames you can generate, either through image to video or through interpolation. Probably due to the nature of samplers, training, and even just how the model works and whatnot, generating very small amounts of frames will lead to very noisy results. This is especially more noticeable for interpolation. This means, if you set your duration between an interval of 1 to about 13 frames, you'll get noisy results. Thus, even if you only need a couple of frames, I would set the minimum duration to at least 17, honestly to about 21, to avoid these kinds of results, as shown in these examples. Then you can still pick and choose which of all those frames you want to keep if they're too many, or also just keep them all, depending on the needs of your animation and timeline. I've tried different samplers and parameters, LoRa's and no LoRa's, to see if this could be improved, to be able to generate less frames, but it might just be how the model works. Feel free to post in the comments if you find a way to make lower amounts of frames without noisy results. Also, the model works best at intervals of 4 frames. This means start from 1, then add 4, and you get 5. Thus, 17 plus 4 is 21, and 21 plus 4 is 25, and so on. You actually can set any interval. However, the result will be processed as rounded down to the closest interval that's actually valid, at least in Krita. You can see these examples. The first result was set to an interval of 37, and it indeed is 37 frames long. The second example was set to an interval of 35. However, the result is 33 frames long instead, which is the closest valid interval rounded down from 35. This part of the script initially said I hadn't tested this. Well, I tested it now just to see what it did and can now confirm it does indeed round down to a valid value. The Comfy UI node auto-increases and decreases the values to the proper interval, but the Krita parameter node lets you input any value. Which is why I added the intervals on a separate text box, because I'm dumb at numbers. Just keep that in mind. And lastly, at least for the tips I can remember right now, that I will surely remember more after I publish this video, and at least for non-technical ones I can put in the description instead. Regarding compositing and especially backgrounds, you can do all this manually as mentioned previously, and I still would overall recommend that. But you can also try doing green screening instead, particularly if you plan to do your entire animation all inside Krita itself, instead of taking it to other animation software. This is because, while character consistency is very good, backgrounds can be a bit trickier, especially when characters are already composited on the background and results are generated on a full scene. For example, in this case, you can see it picked up those white speckles as snow, or perhaps sparks, when they were just intended to be spots on the wall. And actual snow, or fog, or anything moving in the background will probably change its direction when using image to video, but maybe also even when using interpolation. So in general, I would say it's better to animate characters, animals, objects, and whatnot, and the background separately, or also not animate the background at all, and then composite both on their own, instead of generating everything together. And that's where green screening can help. Simply apply a bright green background to your keyframes, or any other contrasting color if your character itself has a green color, and do image to video or interpolate on that, then chroma key out the green screen. You can do this in DaVinci Resolve, which is the software I make my videos in. I recommend looking up dedicated tutorials for it, as there are different methods, but I can also explain one of them briefly here. Simply export your animation to a video file, either from Krita or other animation software. Import it to a new DaVinci Resolve file, drag it to the timeline, then go to Resolve FX, 3D Keyer, and drag the effect to that clip. Then click this button, select Open FX Overlay, and draw a vertical line over the green color. Then adjust the sliders, until all the green is removed. Do this with the background already on a separate clip layer below so you can also see how it composites with it. You can also cake on other filters, to make it look less jank, but also more jank in a different way. Again, this is just one method, but there are definitely much better ones. Lastly, for real this time, there are also other methods and models like Wan Animate, Wan Vase, and Wan Fun. They can let you use a reference video to copy its motion and other characteristics. This can be very useful for animating through rotoscoping, either from a live action reference or even a 3D model. However, they're a tiny bit more technical to use, and some of their special nodes don't translate well to Krita nodes, so they're better used directly inside Comfy UI Spaghetti. I recommend looking for dedicated Wan Animate, Wan Vase, and Wan Fun tutorials. Hopefully, this video has been useful in some way. By applying traditional art principles and also traditional animation principles, you really can make anything simply using AI assistance to literally fill in the gaps. You can use regular draw refine with regular image models to make your keyframes, or even use edit models and then use video models to animate those keyframes with all the guidance, control, and consistency you want. This is where traditional animation principles and traditional compositing methods are still very valuable too, as you can apply those to enhance your animation even further. Definitely apply more than the ones I managed to remember to include in this video, and that I probably haven't even thought of at all. 
just like regular image AI, just putting some manual effort of your own compared to just pressing one button can make a huge difference between generic AI slop and something truly unique and yours. Thanks for watching.